Marie, I just, I just need to sit here for a minute before the worship service. There's so much going on in the world. Countries are still fighting. People are still struggling. Rent is not getting paid. It's still a difficult time, and I, I just needed to sit for a minute and think about that. And just, I just kind of needed to hold on to this for a little bit. I'll, I'll be ready in just a little bit. But um, if you don't mind, it's just kind of nice to sit here in this beautiful sanctuary. I feel close to God here and I believe God knows everything that's going on so I just wanted to remind myself of that and to say I'm glad for that Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways, the unrighteous. Let them return to the Lord so that our God may have mercy on all. Good morning. It is so good to have you here. Thank you for joining with us this morning. I hope this is a wonderful day and week for you. I hope you remembered to turn your clocks ahead so that we are worshiping together a little bit later, and great to have you here. Just a couple announcements for us. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day to you. Next Sunday will be a 150th anniversary celebration Sunday. We look forward to that. Rick Rushworth is also going to get the men together again on a Zoom call at 345, so look forward to that. And we hope that you will be part of us and with us as we plan to open our sanctuary back up for worship starting Palm Sunday, March 28th. So please come. There are precautions that we will be taking but we hope that you and friends will join with us as we celebrate being together again. Thank you, and let us worship God.
Will you join with me now responsively in our call to worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for God's steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those God redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and the Lord delivered them from their distress. Let us thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wonderful works to humankind. God satisfies the thirsty, and the hungry are filled with good things. Let those who are wise give heed to these things and consider the steadfast love of the Lord. If we say we have no sin, we remain in the darkness. But if we confess our sin, God is faithful and just and will welcome us into the light. Let us join together in our prayer of confession. God of light and love, in Christ Jesus you proclaimed your love for all creation but we have violated its goodness. We are polluting land and oceans, and we're polluting our neighbors with apathy and judgment. We are depleting nature of vital resources and depleting ourselves of your grace and mercy. Forgive us and be our guide. Help us to be disciplined in taking care of your gifts lest in neglecting them, we lose them forever. Let us continue our prayer in silence. Amen. 
We know that all of creation is groaning with us at all of the pain and suffering in our world. We know that one day when we turn, when we are reunited with God, that suffering, that pain will cease. Friends, the good news of the gospel is that in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Good morning to all of you. We'd like to talk a little bit about how we raise children. Since they're not here, I would like to talk to you who are parents about this. The most critical need that we all have is full acceptance so that we ourselves can believe that we are accepted so that we know that and we feel that. Interestingly enough, it sometimes is the least directly addressed. So what we need to do is to consider how is it we can do that. There are several elements that lead to acceptance for children and adolescents. The period I will be referring to is from age 5 to 17. How we discipline, how we include, how we listen, how we protect, how we express all primary determinants of leading to acceptance. Today, uh, let's take a look at one of those contributors to full acceptance, and that's discipline. Traditionally, we set up discipline to be kind of like parents talk and children obey. Again, I wanted to say, you know, children between 5 and 17 are where I wanted to focus with this. Unfortunately, that is not an effective approach. Here's what I'd like to suggest are some ways to be able to raise children to the point where they are adolescents that they really do feel accepted. I'm calling them again talk times that we have with our children and adolescents. The number again is over 1,200 of those in the period of time starting with five and going through 17. So we have 1,200 instances where we can positively encourage or negatively encourage. Unfortunately, the way discipline is carried out typically is more negative than positive, especially when you consider that parents typically don't do that until they are angry. And that is not a good time to engage in discipline. It's because it's never then a two-way street. And it's got to be, if we're going to be effective with this, it's got to be two-way. We have to listen as well as talk. We have to invite our child, adolescents, our CA, you know, to engage in that. And indeed, adding that it's two-way from the standpoint that not only are we giving them feedback, but we ask them to give us feedback. And so the sessions that we engage in that are disciplinary, then are ones in which it's experienced that way. It's not just me, father, talking to child, but also children talking to parent. It reminds me that my son, Scott, gave me feedback. He said, you keep explaining. He said, you explain and explain and explain. I don't have to explain that many times. Okay, well, that's, that's very useful for us if we are willing to accept that. The most critical time, though, so far as the impact it has on children feeling like they're being accepted, is a post-discipline time. After the, the talk talk is over, what do we do? What we've got to be sure we do is, is to establish it such that the, only the disciplinary act is in focus, not them as you know, human beings. And that's why if we make disparaging comments to a child, they will start generalizing and they will wind up 
with the negative self-concept. And that we cannot, cannot do and don't even realize oftentimes when we are doing it. All right. Children really need to feel at the close of a discipline instance that they are okay. Their act, the, what they did, may not be considered that way, but they're okay. So that means we also, after a disciplinary session with a child, we need to find ways in which we give them feedback that that is the case. It can be very direct. Sometimes it, it can be a touch. What's been observed is, is that oftentimes, after a, a disciplinary talk-talk, the parent leaves the child. That's typically an expression of anger yet occurring and why we should not do it when we're angry. You know, there's an advertisement I saw recently in which at the end of a interaction, the mother reached out and touched the nose of her daughter. That is definitely an act of acceptance. There's a number of ways we can do that, but we certainly need to be sure so that the child does not start internalizing the negative aspects that we may be expressing. Again, very likely the most critical need humans have is that of being, of feeling that they are accepted. The greatest thing that loving does is communicate acceptance, but by itself it's not enough. So let me invite you to think about how you go about then engaging in discipline with your children and adolescents or grandchildren or even great grandchildren. Thank you.
from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. If you grew up going to Sunday school, you probably had to memorize at some time John 3:16, for God so loved the world. And whether you've been churched or not, you've likely heard this verse a lot. For a while, references to this passage seem to be everywhere, in end zones and crowds and skating rinks, even on food wrappers and shopping bags. It is the summation of the Christian faith. It's become the central message. The verse comes in the middle of Jesus' explanation to Nicodemus, the Pharisee who sought Jesus out at night to question him about the faith and being born again. The passage begins with a play on words lifted up. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes may in him have eternal life. Those words are from an Old Testament story found in the book of Numbers. When the people began despairing about being able to survive in the wilderness, no food and water, they complained against God and Moses. Consequently, in this story, God sent serpents, snakes, to bite the people, killing some. When they repented, the Lord instructed Moses to make a bronze serpent, set it on a pole, and lift it up so that anyone who had been bitten might look at it and live. I don't like thinking about snakes. But here's an interesting thought. Theologian Cornelius Plantinga notes that the cure for snake bite is another snake. One of the only sure ways to cure an infection is exposure, inoculation, which allows the memory to be activated to destroy the disease. The disease is used to cure the disease. Many diseases plague us today. Aside from COVID, we are afflicted by greed, hatred, self-hatred, fear, apathy, both individually and collectively. Our economic and political life is fraught with injustice. Plantiga says that the intriguing, 
mind-bending, agonizing truth of Christianity is the claim that God took our diseases on God's self in order to become the antidote. As he puts it, Christianity is the only religion that centers around the dying and degradation of its God. Why would anyone want to lift up such a horrific reality to gaze upon it? Because the exposure disrupts the power of the disease and reveals the love and justice of God in Christ as the antidote. The disease can cure the disease. Why do we have to look at death in order to receive life? For God so loved the world. And here we must understand the meaning of so loved. It's not only about how much God loved the world, though it is definitely about so much. It's also about the way in which God loved the world. It is better translated this is the way God loved the world. In this way, God loved the world. God loved it by giving his only son. God loved the world by allowing his son to die, lifted up on a cross, so that when we look at that and see his love for us, we will live. Jesus' coming is like the bringing of light into a dark space. Throughout John's Gospel, we're given stories of people who chose light over darkness. Nicodemus was the seeker by night, who was left in confusion, only to reappear at the end to help care for Jesus' body. The Samaritan woman, in darkness over who it was speaking with her and offering her living water, finally steps into the light. And the blind man who was healed, moving physically from darkness to light, also moved into the light spiritually when he realized who it was who healed him. The contrast between darkness and light, believing and unbelieving, death and life, is what the gospel writer wants us to see. We need to choose. There is a decision to make. Will we accept? that this is what God has done purely for love of us and for the world, death or life. One morning in 1888, Alfred Nobel, inventor of dynamite, awoke to read his own obituary. The obituary was printed as a result of a simple journalistic error. It was Alfred's brother who had died, and the reporter just carelessly reported the death of the wrong brother. Anyone would be disturbed in those circumstances. But to Alfred, the shock was overwhelming because he got to see himself as the world saw him, the dynamite king, the great industrialist who had made an immense fortune from explosives. 
As far as the general public was concerned, this was the entire purpose of Alfred's life. None of his true intentions to break down the barriers that separated people and his ideas for peace were recognized or given serious consideration. He was simply a merchant of death. For that alone, he would be remembered. As he read the obituary with horror, he resolved to make clear to the world the true meaning and purpose of his life. This would be done through the final disposition of his fortune. His last will and testament, as you know, was an endowment of six annual prizes for outstanding contributions in physics, chemistry, physiology, literature, economics, and peace. Those would be the expression of his life's ideals and ultimately would be why he was remembered. The dark news in his obituary revealed the dark path in some of his choices, and he was cured. Nobel turned his legacy of darkness and death to light and life. The whole of scripture, from creation to revelation, is a story of God's love for the world. It was love that stirred God's heart when the slaves pleaded for freedom in Egypt. It was God's love that raised up prophets who declared God's desire for compassion. It was love that carried Israel during the exile and love that the Psalms celebrate in the rebuilding of the temple. It was God's love that sent Jesus who taught us that love is not merely for those who look and think and believe like us, but even for our enemies and those who persecute us. It was love that motivated the early church to open its doors to Gentiles and to Jews. And we must be sure that God's love continues to be offered to all, all in this world. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved, might be redeemed through him. This is the part of the passage that often gets forgotten and left out. We don't like to think about God condemning. John says if we choose not to accept God's love, we condemn ourselves. But denominations have also been and are guilty of condemning. Plenty of people have been denied access to the church, its leadership, its ministry. God's love has been limited for some because of age or gender or sexual orientation, ethnicity, economic status, disability, mental health. Does God so love the world? The first week in the pulpit at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, Martin Luther King Jr. preached on John 3.16. He said, God's love has breadth. It is a big love. It is a broad love. God's love is too big 
to be limited to a particular race. It is too big to be wrapped in a particular garment. It is too great to be encompassed by any single nation. God is a universal God. This unlimited love has been a ray of hope and has given a sense of belonging to hundreds of disinherited people. God's love is not in short supply. It will never run out. God gave God's most precious gift, an only child, to show us how and how much we are loved. It has breadth. It has depth. It is infinite and immeasurable and as close to you as your next breath. Come into the light. Choose life. Return to love. And will you join with me now to affirm our faith using this version of 1 Peter 3. Please join me. Washed in the saving waters of baptism, we give thanks for the ark of the church. Joined to the faithful of all times and places, we proclaim the suffering of Christ for the sins of all. We rejoice and trust that the righteousness of Christ brings us to God. The death of Christ proclaims God's love. The resurrection of Christ awakens our spirits and the ascension of Christ enthrones him as Lord. Therefore, with a good conscience and obedient lives, we proclaim our faith in Jesus Christ, even if for that faith we must suffer. So be it. Shall we join our hearts in prayer? Oh God, we pray for those who today feel disinherited, feel turned away, feel not good enough. We pray for those who are grasping for their lives. We pray for those who do not know the immeasurable love that you offer. God, we ask that you will continue to have mercy, that you will continue to draw those to yourself. And God, we include our own as we ask for that mercy. We pray that you will infuse us with the love that you have shown us in Jesus Christ, that we may be instruments of that love toward others. Help us know how to be an inclusive church welcoming all, believing that your love is for all the world, for this creation and for its people, Lord, we pray and ask you for your grace, ask you to make your love palpable for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
as we go through this week, may you know deep within yourselves how much you are loved. And may you remember as we continue through Lent and anticipate the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, that that is the way God has loved us, to give us everything. I pray that you will claim that for yourselves, that you will trust that as you continue your journey each day. And may the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ our Lord, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all and bless us now and forever. Amen.